This, this is, is Saurabh, and, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, show the, the, the Weekly Show with Aditya. Aditya. The various sporting leagues around the world have had a twofold purpose. On one hand, they are a livelihood for the stakeholders involved, the athletes, the governing bodies, the ground staff, the referees and the various match officials, the sponsors, many other different stakeholders involved in the conduct of a sports match. But on the other hand, it's a distraction for the audience, the individuals who watch these sporting tournaments. Even before this whole nonsense of this virus emerged, for the spectators, these matches were, the sports matches were always a distraction. But now, the terminology has been used, restarting the various sporting tournaments, both international and domestic. Not only a distraction from all the nonsense around this virus, but also a relief, a break from all the rhetoric and the relentless negative campaigning that has been added to the whole virus shedding. The idea of distraction, what distraction means is different for different people. For some distraction is the much needed relief from the mundane tasks we are involved in. For others, distraction is actually distraction. For example, when you are doing an assignment or doing something that is important, which requires a lot of concentration, suddenly the bell rings. Who is at the door? Some unimportant person. Individuals involved in pseudo work who are nothing more than a distraction. In fact, they are not the distraction kind we need where we need break from our mundane task. But they are the kind of distraction that is unneeded, unwanted distraction. But that is what they do best. Ring the bell, you are working on something, suddenly your attention is diverted from the task in hand. But looking at in both ways, humans crave distraction. We all want some kind of distraction, but not the kind of distraction I just described. That is the kind of distraction we don't want. But if you go beyond such tracked ideas, distraction is essentially a human creation. Narrative has been constructed that your cell phones, your computers and pseudo media is a distraction. Well, I disagree with such ideology. No, the dumb smartphones, your electronic devices and pseudo media is not a distraction. It becomes a distraction if we allow it to become a distraction. Which means while I cannot stop people from ringing the bell and disturbing us and distracting us from our work, I can most definitely stay away from my dumb smartphone if I want, even if the smartphone or internet and such technologies are an essential part of the digital revolution or what I said in my previous episode, those who were listening intently, digital double speak. You may not be able to mute the doorbell, but I can mute, switch off my smartphones, your electronic devices and internet as a whole. Yes, internet phones are not a distraction in the definition of distraction which we understand. They are created distractions. If I want I will not allow myself to be affected by looking at my phone. It is not the end of the world if a few messages that have been received on my phone or on my email, I read them a few hours late. Apart from the doorbell, which is a headache, and the smartphones and other electronic devices, which can be controlled in terms of being a distraction. Why do human beings crave for distraction? Because that's how we are 
program as how our organic and natural cpu functions that's how the brain functions sports and theater have been a distraction for human beings from their mundane tasks for millennia whether it was watching plays 200 years ago which transformed into watching movies and tv shows in the contemporary times to watching sports matches it has always been a conscious decision let's analyze these lines one study in 2014 showed that when two people are talking the mere presence of a dumb smartphone resting on a table is enough to change the character of the conversation this is a subjective analysis because if i am one of those two people and even if a mobile phone is on the table will it distract me no it will not and this analysis is also not true for every one it's a very small sample size which has been taken to analyze this distraction is your brain ducking challenging feelings such as boredom loneliness insecurity fatigue and uncertainty once again it's subjective yes humans by nature are bored if by nature humans want bored then we would call ourselves artificial and superficial beings loneliness well that's subjective again one individual's distraction is other individuals extracurricular activities human beings in their unfound love for artificial beings inanimate objects and robots are becoming robots themselves which is not directly related to emotions but the idea of being robotic means we do the same mundane tasks every day but remember not every task is mundane the mundane task would include the daily drudgery of the household chores it's on a loop like a broken tape recorder yet these tasks have to be completed without thinking much they are a distraction from the distraction of work or distraction from work but limiting distractions to just technology is a fatal flaw in human beings technology is not a distraction we make technology a form of distraction not the end of the world if you don't have a thousand apps on your phone it's not compulsory to have a thousand apps on your phone in fact the ringing of the doorbell is a bigger distraction than any distraction ever created this ringing is part of the mundane tasks we have created for ourselves in fact if the bell didn't ring impression that could be created in our minds is that nothing is happening the day is not moving while on one hand humans crave for distractions like entertainment and sport distraction is equally subjective and how does an individual circumvent the distraction when well, that is subjective and relative to each and every individual there is no universal solution to craving distractions reading session 2 kite runner upstairs was my bedroom baba's bedroom and his study also known as the smoking room which perpetually smelled of tobacco and cinnamon baba and his friends reclined on black leather chairs there after ali had served dinner they stuffed their pipes except baba always called it fattening the pipe and discussed their favorite three topics politics business soccer sometimes i asked baba if i could sit with them but baba would stand in the doorway go on now he'd say this is grown ups time 
Why don't you go read one of those books of yours? He closed the door, leave me to wonder why it was always grown-ups time with him. I'd sit by the door, knees drawn up to my chest. Sometimes I sat there for an hour, sometimes two, listening to their laughter, their chatter. The living room downstairs had a curved wall with custom-built cabinets. Inside sat framed family pictures, an old grainy photo of my grandfather and King Nadir Shah taken in 1931, two years before the king's assassination. They are standing over a dead deer dressed in knee-high boots, rifles slung over their shoulders. There was a picture of my parents' wedding night, Baba dashing in his black suit and my mother a smiling young princess in white. There was Baba and his best friend and business partner Rahim Khan standing outside our house, neither one smiling. I am a baby in that photograph and Baba is holding me looking tired and grim. I am in his arms but it's Rahim Khan's pinky my fingers are curled around. The curved wall led into the dining room, at the center of which was a mahogany table that could easily sit 30 guests. And given my father's taste for extravagant parties, it did just that almost every week. On the other end of the dining room was a tall marble fireplace, always lit by the orange glow of a fire in the winter time. A large sliding glass door opened into a semicircular terrace that overlooked two acres of backyard and rows of cherry trees. Baba and Ali had planted a small vegetable garden along the eastern wall. Tomatoes, mint, peppers and a row of corn that never really took. Hassan and I used to call it the wall of the ailing corn. Wedding session to labors of Hercules. Both ladies seemed relieved by the magic word. Porot went on. You have the letter. Lady Hogan shook her head. No, I was instructed to enclose it with the money. And you did so? Yes. Hmm. That is a pity. Miss Carnaby said brightly, but I have the dog lead still. Shall I get it? She left the room. Hercule Perot profited by her absence to ask a few pertinent questions. Amy Carnaby. Oh, she's quite all right. A good soul, though foolish, of course. I have had several companions and have all been complete fools. But Amy was devoted to Shan Tung and she was terribly upset over the whole thing. As well as she might be hanging over perambulators and neglecting my little sweetheart. These old maids are all the same. Idiotic over babies. No, I'm quite sure she had nothing whatever to do with it. It does not seem likely, Poirot agreed. But as the dog disappeared when in her charge, one must make quite certain of her honesty. She has been with you long, nearly a year. I had excellent references with her. She was with old lady Hartingfield until she died, 10 years I believe. After that, she looked after an invalid sister for a while. She really is an excellent creature, but a complete fool as I said. Amy Carnaby returned at this minute, slightly more out of breath and produced the cut dog lead, which she handed to Poirot with the utmost solemnity, looking at him with 
of full expectancy. Poirot surveyed it carefully. May we, he said, this has undoubtedly been cut. The two women waited expectantly. He said, I will keep this. Suddenly, he put it in his pocket. The two women breathed a sigh of relief. He had clearly done what was expected of him. It was the habit of Hercule Poirot to leave nothing untested. Though on the face of it, it seemed unlikely that Miss Carnaby was anything but the foolish and rather muddle-headed woman that she appeared to be. Poirot nevertheless managed to interview a somewhat forbidding lady who was the niece of the late Lady Hartingfield. Reading Session 3, The Iliad When he caught some common soldier shouting out, he would beat him with the scepter, dress him down. You fool, sit still, obey the commands of others, your superiors, you, you deserter, rank, coward, you count for nothing, neither in war nor council. How can all Achaeans be masters here in Troy? Too many kings can ruin an army. Mob rule. Let there be one commander, one master only, endowed by the son of crooked-minded Cronus, kingly scepter and royal knights of custom. Whatever one man needs to lead his people well, we range the ranks commanding men to order, and back again they surge from ships and shelters, back to the meeting grounds with a deep, pounding din, thundering out as battle lines of breakers crash and drag along some endless beach and the rough sea rows. The armies took their seats, marshaled into ranks, but one man, Tear cities still railed on non-stop. His head was full of obscenities, teeming with rant, all for no good reason, insubordinate, baiting the kings, anything to provoke some laughter from the troops. Here was the ugliest man who ever came to Troy. Bandy-legged he was, with one foot clubbed, both shoulders humped together, curving over his caved-in chest and bobbing over them, his skull warped to a point, sprouting clumps of scraggly, woolly hair. Achilles despised him most. Odysseus, too, he was always abusing both chiefs, but now he went for majestic Agamemnon, hollering out, taunting the king with strings of cutting insults. The Achaeans were furious with him, deeply offended, but he kept shouting at Agamemnon, spewing his abuse, still moaning and groaning mighty attreats. Why now? What are you panting after now? Your shelters packed with lion shares of bronze, plenty of women too. Crowding your lodges, best of the lot, the beauties we hand you first, whenever we take some stronghold, or still more gold you are wanting, more ransom a son of the stallion, breaking Trojans, might just fetch from Troy. Though I or another hero drags him back in chains, or a young woman, is it? to spread and couple, to bed down for yourself apart from all the troops. How shameful for you, the high and mighty commander, to lead the sons of Achaia into bloody slaughter. Sons, know my soft friends, wretched excuses. Women, not men of Achaia, whom we go in our ships, abandon him here in Troy to wallow in all his prizes. He'll see if the likes of us have propped him or not. Look, 
now it's Achilles, a greater man, he disgraces, seizes and keeps his prize, tears her away himself, but no gall in Achilles, Achilles lets it go, if not, it reads that outrage would have been your last. Tweeting session 4, PG Woodhouse. And by what I have always thought an odd coincidence, her wish was granted. A crashing sound like that made by a herd of hippopotami going through the reeds on a river bank attracted my notice and I beheld Spood approaching at the rate of notch with the obvious intention of resuming as early a date as possible his investigations into the color of Gussie's insights which Stinker's intervention had compelled him to file under the head of unfinished business. In predicting that this menace in the treatment though crushed to earth would rise again, I had been perfectly correct. There seemed to be a strong resemblance in the newcomer's manner to that of those Assyrians who, so we learn from sources close to them, came down like a wolf on the fold with their cohorts all gleaming with purple and gold. He could have walked straight into their camp and then they would have laid down the red carpet for him, recognizing him instantly as one of the boys. But where the Assyrians had had the bulge on him was that they weren't going to find in the fold a motherly young woman with strong wrist and a basin in her hands. This basin appeared to be constructed of some thickish form of china, and as Spoot grabbed Gussie and started to go into the old shaking routine, it descended on the back of his head with what some call a dull and others a sickening thud. It broke into several fragments, but by that time its mission had been accomplished. His powers of resistance sapped, no doubt by his recent encounter with the Reverend H.P. Pinker, Spood fell to earth he knew not where and lay there looking peaceful. I remember thinking at the time that this was not his lucky day and it just showed. I thought that it's always a mistake to be a louse in human shape as he had been from birth because sooner or later retribution is bound to overtake you. As I recall Jeeves putting it once, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small or words to that effect. For a space, Emerald Stoker stood, surveying her handiwork with a satisfied smile on her face, and I didn't blame her for looking a bit smug, for she had unquestionably fought the good fight. Then, suddenly, with a quick, oh golly, she was off like a nymph, surprised while bathing. And a moment later, I understood what had caused this mobility. She had seen Madeleine Basset approaching, and no cook likes to have to explain to her employer why she has been bonneting her employer's guests with China basins. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.